Hello, and welcome back to the Eastern Mediterranean Times. I'm your host, Martin Mont. And I'm your host, Joshua Litke. All right, jumping right into it. Our first story today concerns the war in Gaza. Three hostages, uh, three Israeli hostages that were held by Hamas have now been killed by Israeli operations within southern Gaza this week. Yeah, so we're looking right now, the Israeli military has announced that its own troops have killed three hostages uh, who were waving light flags reportedly uh, in a uh, operation to anti-terror operation incident uh, and Israeli leaders are saying that this is not in within their code of conduct this they don't they do not condone this action they're apologizing for it they're saying it's a tragedy uh, but Palestinians have also been saying that Israeli troops have been firing on uh, civilians who have been running away uh, and this isn't the first incident of this happening here. And human rights groups warned that this was very much a possibility at the beginning of the assaults following the ceasefire brokered by the United States and Qatar. This was a big issue that came up during those. Yeah. People were protesting within Israel who are the families of hostages because they were saying that Netanyahu's government was going to kill them yep. by increasing operations and bombing within the area. And th this is just an echo in, into the chamber that, that the human rights groups have been have been speaking since the beginning of this conflict. Yeah, but I think people are starting to listen on some level because you're looking at the United States taking a massive shift away from its we stand with Israel no matter what kind of policy here. Absolutely. With President Biden coming out and saying that the Israeli government needs to dramatically rethink its strategy in Gaza and maintain human rights. And Vice President Harris has even reportedly been encouraging the administration to take steps towards a peace process and conflict pause or ceasefire oriented approach. Absolutely. All right. Our next story also can uh, also contains the United States and its efforts in the Middle East, specifically in its efforts to protect trade in the Red Sea. Houthi rebels from Yemen have been threatening ships, which are now in most cases rerouting from going through the Suez Canal to going around the Horn of Africa, which is a longer trip and it's more dangerous in some cases. Yeah, I would say that we're looking at a massive rethink in policy uh, around this. We've normally just had convoy strategies where a lot of shipping uh, routes will have a protected convoy, but some of those are starting to get attacked as well by the Houthi rebels. Uh, and this threat is calling on the United States to send in a strike carrier uh, force into the region to ensure that trade continues to flow freely and without any rebel attacks against them. Yeah, and this will become an international issue very quickly because that trade is not only going to Israel, not only going to the United States and its European allies, it's coming from countries in Africa, it's going from into China, India, and uh, Saudi Arabia, and a lot of other Middle Eastern countries. This, this has to do with economic benefits that these countries need in order to stabilize their economies. Countries like Egypt rely heavily on the Suez Canal for a foreign influx of currency reserves, which is something that they desperately need right now because they've been using their currency reserves to buff their own currency up so that they can actually battle some of that inflationary action that's been happening within their country when it comes to imports and exports. Mm -hmm. And a, re a reduction of this foreign reserve influx by people not using the Suez, thinking that the Red Sea is too dangerous, that's going to hurt Egypt. Then when it comes to China, if countries have less demand for products because these products are becoming more expensive and taking more time, this is going to hurt some of their fast action product sales with new companies such as Timu and Sheen who have really risen in the past year and come to the American market and the European markets very strong. If they can't produce that cheap, those cheap goods, like they have been this past year, especially when it comes to the very spending time of year in across the across the globe, if they can't keep those prices where they are, and if this is really going to impact their shipping operations, it can become a huge problem for more than just the countries directly involved with the Israel conflict. Yeah, and on top of that, we're also seeing the United States 
having more activity in the region with airstrikes in southern Syria as well. Do you want to tell us more about that, Mark? Yeah, so there's also been airstrikes against Iranian-backed groups, although the Houthi rebels in Yemen are also Iranian-backed. But there's Iranian-backed groups in southern Syria. They've been supporting the al-Assad regime in Syria. They were originally supported by the, the Russians as well prior to the 2000 prior to 2014 and they, they've they've been looming in the area but they've been more prevalent and noticeable within both politics and the news be, during the uh, Gaza inv- the invasion of Gaza and, and the October 7th attacks and the United States trying to secure some of their assets in the region by coming after these Iranians supported strongholds and a lot of the times these attacks especially the ones that were announced last Tuesday to have been successful were t- specifically targeting military deposits of weaponry and this is really important because there's a lot of ex-Soviet weaponry and Russian weaponry that's been kept in Syria and being able to destroy some of that will probably reduce the kind of ability for some of these smaller arms groups to really keep up a fight in the region. And and the small arms groups are really what's causing a problem here for the United States and their allies regionally. Not many countries, in fact, no other country than Israel, and with, with the exception of Syria and Iraq, but that's a different problem. No other country in the region is at war, technically, with another for, with another actual state entity. So these small arms militias are a big problem, and taking out weapons deposits is the Pentagon's way of responding to that. Indeed. All right, now moving over to another story, we have at least 61 people have died in another migrant shipwreck in the Mediterranean. This year has claimed the lives of uh, many people, and since 2014, almost 30,000 people have died in the Mediterranean, specifically migrants trying to come up from Africa and the Middle East because of issues like climate change and global insecurity. And there have been really, really unfortunate accidents when it comes to boats tipping over, waves being pushed away by naval powers that are trying to keep them out of their uh, contiguous zones, all sorts of tragedies. Yeah, so we're looking at, as you've said, climate change, famine, and... Uh, conflict have all been spurring this massive influx in migration across the Mediterranean. And we're seeing that these are primarily African refugees that are trying to get away from all of this in their countries and get to safety in Europe uh, by crossing the Mediterranean uh, and usually going through smugglers and human traffickers to do so. Uh, and we've seen a massive increase in shipwrecks, capsizing events. And as you said, it's been 28,000 people estimated by the uh, International Organization for Migration uh, have passed away uh, since 2014 in the Mediterranean. And there's been a massive uptick this year. We've seen numerous incidences where above 50 people, at least above 50 people, if not over 100 people, have drowned uh, or perish, and many people are still missing to this day. And those are only the recorded accidents. That yes. should be the, the highlight of this, is that it's really hard to track actual incidents in yes. the region because these are all undocumented yeah. trips and a lot of them are even financed in completely untraceable ways when it comes to the ability of those governments in northern africa to track these these migrants right so it's become a big problem because even these numbers are very much underestimates right and we're looking at the policies in europe too kind of creating more obstacles uh, for us to be able to really know what's happening because Italy and Greece uh, have especially adopted very anti-immigration policies uh, recently uh, with their governments uh, to try to manage this influx of people and not get over, have their own systems overwhelmed. And as a result of that, it's making the Mediterranean become a lot more of a formidable border rather than a crossing. Uh, and because of overwhelmed rescue crews from those countries, there's not really a, a lot of people that are able to help. Uh, we're seeing some movement with leaders of Albania, Italy, and the UK meeting to discuss and tackle issues mm-hmm. of the influx of migration, sustainable development in Africa, and combating human trafficking operations. But human rights organizations worry that this is just going to be a meeting to create more camps in Albania to send migrants to and essentially just keep them there uh, as processing happens. And and that's been a problem throughout this year. Yes. 
And, and moving over to our last story, COP28 has come to an end this week, and although it definitely started out with not a very promising note, both where it took place being in the Middle East and some of the big players who were absent, primarily President Joe Biden, uh, it, it ended on a good note. Yes, we're looking at the COP28 conference, which has been trying to address climate change. COP has been fairly su successful in at least bringing countries together to have discussions on these issues in the past. And it was looking like it might have lost all remaining means of legitimacy uh, at, by the end of this conference by holding it in Dubai, a major, uh, or a city within the UAE, which is a major oil state. Uh, and also the leadership of this conference have all had ties and links to natural gas and oil companies. And that has like created a lot of damaging implications for COPE and whether it actually is trying to tackle climate change. However, that being said, it seems that mainly thanks to European and U.S. delegations as well as small island uh, states and numerous other developing countries that did want to come together and tackle climate change and did want to make meaningful action on this. They were able to come together and come to an agreement that they finally, in a historic first, addressed fossil fuels as the main culprit behind By name, climate change. By which name. Which was something that environmentalists were worried wasn't going to happen. Yes. And this is the first time that this has happened as in a global document that we have addressed that fossil fuels is the main culprit and that we have to tr transition away from fossil fuels in order to adequately address and curb climate change. So while certainly a lot more has to be done on this issue, it was a step in the right direction and it at least saved face for COPE. We'll see what happens in the next one. Absolutely. And with the conclusion of COPE, Coincidentally, it's the conclusion of the first season of this IEMS podcast. The first season of the Eastern Mediterranean Times podcast will be closing this week. Um, we, we're taking a break as it's the end of the school semester. And we're going to come back with a podcast after the next semester picks up. It'll be season two. Look forward to it. There's going to be some slight changes, but we'll keep you in the dark for now. We want to make it a surprise. But don't worry, we're still going to be sending out our weekly newsletter. Yes. So you can still stay up to date on all this information over the winter break. All right. I've been your host, Martin Mont. And I've been your host, Josh Wojcicki. Thank you for tuning in this entire season, season one. Have a great winter break.